Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead, and lead us, us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For, for yours, yours is the kingdom, the kingdom and, and the power and the, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in week three of this Pray Like This series where we are looking at uh, how Jesus taught his disciples to pray because the truth is most of us pray. I don't know where you are in your faith in Jesus or what your beliefs are. And maybe you're someone who's like, you know, I don't really do the whole Christian Jesus God thing. But still, factually, even when when people don't believe in God, they pray because we're seeking help. We're seeking some sort of connection, especially when life gets difficult, but most of us, while we pray, I think we'd all admit that that's probably not one of our strongest skill sets. Like, I'm not very good at praying. I'm not very comfortable with it. If I were to call on you right now and say, hey, we pray for us right now, most of you would be like, "Uh uh-uh, it's not my thing. And so we're looking at this of how did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Because the disciples looked at Jesus, saw his prayer life, and how it impacted his life, and how he was connected to God the Father, and they said, Jesus, will you teach us this skill? Will you teach us how to pray? And Jesus teaches them, and he teaches them in the mold of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, the most famous prayer of all time. And to kind of calibrate ourselves together, we've been reading this together. Uh, and so normally we have the TVs on the, on, the, on the wall. We're a little messed up because we're Peyton. So follow along on this TV with me. If you can't see over there, trust, maybe if you know the prayer, we'll go with it. It's okay. But let's read this together. Ready? Out loud. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so this is what Jesus taught. And this wasn't a lesson on what to pray. It wasn't just say this prayer over and over and this is how you pray. This was a lesson on how to pray, a model for how we communicate with God and how we live our lives. This shows us how we live our lives as followers of Jesus. And if you're someone here in person or watching online that you would not kind of call yourself a follower of Jesus, this is a good series for you because you're kind of like looking into, okay, this is what it should look look like for people to follow Jesus. Maybe you've had some issues with how followers of Jesus have represented themselves in not not flattering ways. Well, this is a way you can look in like this is what it's supposed to be about. And what we've been doing is week one, we looked at the first one, our Father in heaven, and how Jesus was teaching us that when we pray, we should worship. We should have adoration to God. This is how we start. It gets our focus off of ourselves and on to God. And last week, we prayed the most dangerous prayer possible, and that's your kingdom come, your will be done. This idea of submission and lordship, that Jesus is in charge, that we submit to his will over our own, that we want his kingdom being built over our own kingdoms. And we keep going today by looking at what we start asking specifically in our personal lives for prayer. And really what we're looking at is this idea of dependence, because uh, dependence is a big deal, right? Kids, think about little kids, you know, as they're growing up, they are extremely dependent on everything and everybody around them. They need parents to feed them, to change them, to take care of them. They need to to give them a drink, a snack, buckle them in the car seat. Uh, Full confession, I have forgotten to buckle Kobe in his car seat so many times our youngest. It's like the third kid. You forget about him a little bit more. Luckily, Kobe's really good at it. I'll get in the driver's. He's like, Daddy. I'm like, what? He's like, you didn't buckle me. I'm like, oh, man. And so, you know, we, they need us for that stuff. I'm not complaining. This is how kids operate. We, we, we love to serve our kids. But as they get older, they start moving from dependence to independence, right? And they love it. You know, one of the things Noah, my oldest, can do now is he can take out our dog, Bo, outside. And that's, that's usually the thing that I have to do. And the fact that he's willing to do it now is fantastic. And it's really good now that I know he can do it. He'll go, I don't want to do it. I'm like, it doesn't matter. This is your chore now. Like, this is your independence. And it's really good for me. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they grow up and they want to be more independent. And that's the goal for all of us, right? To go from dependence to independence. Like, none of us now need to call our parents to come over to our house to make sure we're buckled in our, our seat, right, when we're driving the car. We can do that on our own. We'll, we should be able to. Uh, we don't call our parents for everything in the world. In fact, the word dependency kind of has a negative connotation when we, when we get older, right? The idea of being dependent on something or someone else. We hear the word codependency, and it sounds bad. 
We don't want to be dependent on anything or anyone. We want to be able to kind of live our lives on our own, take care of ourselves. We want independence. As a little kid, they start saying this and start longing for this when they're the ones saying, well, I can do it. I can do this. This is mine. Like when Kobe wants to do something on his own, he's like, I can do this. This is my job now. You know, when they start driving, you have a 16 year old, they start driving, they have that freedom. They can drive or, you know, with, go, go places, take themselves to school or work. As a parent, you get excited for a little bit, but you're also like, oh my goodness, my little baby's growing up and he can drive or she can drive wherever they want to go now. Uh, when they go to college or move out, no longer are they under your rules, under your curfews. They're doing whatever they want, which may freak you out as a parent if that's where you're at right now. Uh, but they have this independence. You know, eventually they go to financial independence, although I feel like more and more like college-age kids and young adults don't want to do that. But they do that. They go to financial independence where they are living life on their own, paying their own rent or mortgage, paying their own bills. And as an American culture, it's very rooted in this idea of independence. But if we're going to pray like Jesus teaches us to, it's going to flip upside down a little bit. We actually will go against this mentality of independence. To be clear, independence is a good thing in a lot of cases. But, to t but the, the idea of dependence is not a negative word like sometimes we think it is. Because what if life works best? What if life works best when we need to depend on God? And this is what we're getting at in this week of pray like this. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, worship, adoration, to submit to his lordship, that dangerous prayer there. But then he gets to more of a personal, here's what you start praying for when it comes to your personal stuff. And because Jesus isn't anti-asking things for ourselves. He, he encourages us. But we, he wants to get our heart centered on God first before we start looking at our own lives. And then he's, after we do that, then it's time to start asking and praying for our own personal lives. And he says this, he says, give us today our daily bread. And this is all we're looking at today in this prayer is give us today our daily bread. And before we get into the details of the prayer, let's look at the overall idea of this. Jesus is teaching us when he says, give us today our daily bread. He is teaching us to have total dependency on God. This isn't just for our daily food. It's for our daily need of everything, whatever that need may be. And the tension is this, that we often want spiritual independence, when it comes to our faith with God, we, we like the idea of God uh, you know, getting us to heaven and saving us. We want the big picture stuff. God, save me. God, rescue me. God, don't punish me. God, you know, God, forgive me. But we don't want God as much to the day-to-day -day stuff. Because we, as we learned last week, when we start praying for that and wanting God's will over our will, it starts messing up our everyday lives. It starts screwing up our own dreams and our own kingdoms and our own goals. Unless it benefits us, we like to keep God at a distance, but the idea of depending on God every single day, this kind of changes things. And this ties into last week's message, like I mentioned. But when Jesus says to pray for our daily bread, he's teaching us to bring God into every aspect of our everyday life, everything you do. He is teaching us that our need is dependent on and provided by him. It's not why well, I worked hard for that. I've earned that. Well, you know, I've earned this. I've provided for my family. You know, sure, all those things can be true depending on your context of life, except we need to see that oftentimes the things in our lives, the things that we've worked hard for, the house over our head, the food we put on the table, yes, we've worked for that, but God provided those opportunities to make that happen. There are everyday opportunities, the everyday things, the everyday needs that are met for us. Yeah, we've done our part to get that, but God has provided those opportunities to provide that need. Jesus is teaching us to understand that our daily need is dependent on God, and we need to seek that provision from the one who provides. The more we depend on God, the better our lives work according to God's design. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest theologians ever, uh, I would say, said it this way. He said, a car is made to run on gasoline, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. You see, we can't do this without him. There is no other, he says. We are dependent on God. If our lives are going to work by the way they were designed, it has to include God being involved with everything we do in life. Dependency on God isn't a weak thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. It's not a crutch or something to be embarrassed about because oftentimes we take pride by saying, look what I did. But to pray the way Jesus teaches us to and depend on God is not showing weakness. 
It's not showing that we're not, you know, strong adults who can do life on our own. It's showing us that we know what it takes to make life work the way God designed. Praying for God's dependence is acknowledging who God is and trusting he will provide. And Jesus is teaching us that part of praying is coming into this daily communion with him and recognizing that God is the one we have to depend on for our daily need. And this prayer, if we pray this and we seek this out, it will cause us to depend on God more in our everyday lives. And that's what this prayer does. But how do we do it? It's one of those weird things. Like we just say, that God, provide my daily food, you know, whatever it is. Like, what, what, do we do? what do we do? What does this prayer look like in our everyday lives? And remember, this isn't Jesus teaching us to just say these words. He's teaching us how to live. And what I want to do is I want to give us four things of how we live this and how we pray this prayer out in our everyday lives. There's four ways I want us to really walk through with this. And the first one is this, is to pray daily. Give us today our daily bread. It's not give us our weekly bread or our monthly bread or, you know, come on Sundays only and say, God, take care of me for this next week. And then we don't talk to him the rest of the week. Like it is a daily prayer. And to depend on God daily means we need to be seeking his dependence out daily as well. It's not just a once a week thing or a once a month thing. It's daily communing with God, daily asking for our needs and seeing God meeting them. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6, he says this, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Paul says in every situation, we often go to prayer when there's big major things happening in our lives, right? Like when there's a big job thing going on or, or a crisis in the family or a health emergency, that's when we really pray. And that's when we really go to God, God, we need to help with this situation. But how often do we pray in the everyday monotony of life? You know, maybe tomorrow's just going to be a regular old boring Monday for you. Or you just spend time asking God to provide for your daily need on a day that you probably don't have to worry about your daily need. Or you seek God daily in this dependence of him. It's in that that we will start seeing God working every day when we start seeking and seeing his dependence and how we rely on him every single day. Because the truth is, we live in a very stressed culture. How many of you guys are stressed? Everyone's probably stressed about something going on, Right? You know, there's the most, there's the reasons for doctor visits. The most reasons for doctor visits in our country is associated with stress. Over half the deaths between the ages of one and 65 years old are due to stressful lifestyles. We spend close to a billion dollars in America on anti-anxiety medication. The U.S. has 5% of the world's population, and yet we use 33% of the pills taken across the world when it comes to stress and anxiety. Besides pills, we self-medicate in other ways. We self-medicate through alcohol, through porn, through busyness, through screen time. We seek ways to de-stress because we are constantly living in stress. And I think one of the biggest reasons for that is we're not seeking out God's daily dependence. We put all this onto ourselves and we try to keep up with the Joneses and keep our status and chase after all these things. In the process of doing that, we put these burdens on our lives and all of a sudden we look around us and wonder why we're so stressed. And we seek out all these ways to medicate that. And I'm not saying it's bad. If you take medication for anxiety, I'm not saying that's bad. We have science that's helping us deal with this stuff. But one of the biggest problems we have is we're ignoring God in our daily dependence for him. We don't seek him out on the everyday monotony of life. And that's what we're called, Jesus is teaching us to do here. So if you're dealing with stuff, how often do you actually pray about it? You feel nervous about a meeting? Are you praying about that before you go into that meeting? Anxious about a health issue? Are you praying about that? Worried about job security? Praying about that? Are you saying, God, no matter what happens, provide my need and help me to see what that need is? Help me to depend on you. My encouragement for us is to try that daily. We've been saying throughout this series, pick a time, pick a place for you to be praying every day as we're going throughout this series and really moving beyond this series. What's your time? What's your place? Pray for this. Seek God's dependence, seek, seek your dependence on God throughout your time of praying. Pray daily. Second thing is this, appreciate the difference between a need and a want. Now, we've all heard this, right? Like, especially when our kids come up, I need this. Well, do you really need it? Of course, we teach them that. But how often should we be like telling ourselves like, Brandon, do you really need that? Is it a want? Is it a need? You know, we're supposed to pray for it all. That's fine. You can pray for anything you want. You can present all your requests to God. But we need to know the difference between a need and a want. Because often we pray for things we want and we assume they're things we need. And we need to change that. 
I'm not saying your wants aren't a big deal. I'm not saying they're not important. But to you, they might be a big deal. They might be serious. It might be things like fix my health, fix my finances, fix my job, fix my spouse, God. Or maybe they're not as serious, like fix the pirates. Like, I'm still hoping for that. That's three weeks in a row I brought the pirates into my message. I don't know. There's something on my mind right now. They're going to be bad this year, but I'm excited for baseball. But we, we, we want these things. And we feel like we need these things. Because they feel like very serious things. Like the idea of there's a health crisis and you want to fix the health crisis, of course. That seems like a very big deal. and is a big deal, but maybe it's not as big of a need as we thought. Or we want more money or more status or more security. It feels like it's a big deal, but maybe it's not as big of a need as we thought. It's actually more of a want. As the great theologian Mick Jagger once said, you can't always get what you want. But if we recognize the difference in needs and wants, this will transform the way we pray. It will transform the way we rely on God. It will also transform the way we live our lives out every single day. All of a sudden, when we realize that our wants aren't really needs, we'll see that our needs are being met by God. Because I'm willing to bet that most of us in this room and watching online right now, our needs are met. Maybe there's problems and there's struggles in life right now, but our daily needs are met. And when we recognize that, when we recognize that our daily needs are met, they, that will then cause us to have gratitude, have more contentment, have more joy, have more appreciation. It will lead us in a culture of, of, of consumption, and that's what we live in right now. In a culture of consumption, we'll be saying, I have enough, and I'm good. Paul writes this in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need. He just went on this list of a big rant right before this. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever, be content whatever the circumstances. I know that it is to be, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul is writing this while he's in prison. He is in prison right now, and he's eventually going to be led to his death, and yet he doesn't see this as a need. He's not saying, oh, I need to get out of prison because this is my need in life. No, his needs are met. He's not worried about this. He's not worried about what's going on in life because he knows his needs are met by God. And he's been through a mess. He's been through shipwrecks. He's been through lack of food. He's been through sicknesses. He's been through it all. And in every situation, he's content because God is providing his daily need. And he ends it with, I can do all things through strike, through Christ who gives me strength. Now, just to be clear, that means that verse that we love dearly, Philippians 4.13, is not about doing a stronger bicep curl at the gym. It's about being content in everything that God is providing us. It's being content in what God is taking care of our needs throughout everything. And we can get there to this mentality when we understand there's a difference between our wants and our needs. But then we also need to do this. We need to put, I mean, put ourselves in position to need God to provide. When was the last time you did that? To put yourself in a position where you need God to provide. Not want God to provide. Like, this will not work, God, if you don't provide. Like, I need you to come through in this situation. One of the biggest reasons I think this part of the prayer that Jesus is teaching is not in our everyday lives is because we're really, really comfortable as people. We don't need God to provide. For the most part, everyone here and watching online, we make enough money. We have plenty of food. We have shelter. We don't have to worry about our needs being met. And that comfort gives us this false feeling of independence. We're good. We don't have to worry about stuff. We don't have to think about stuff. We don't have to worry about where our next meal is coming from for the most part. And the problem is, though, being comfortable doesn't lead us to depend on God. And if Jesus is teaching us to pray, to depend on God in every aspect of our daily life, and we're so comfortable, we don't even think about the idea of depending on God, then obviously there's a disconnect here. You see, when Jesus started his mission, he lived this out to his core. 
He left his carpenter job, his family business job, to start his ministry that God ordained him to do. He had no place to stay. In fact, one guy wanted to come up and be a follower of Jesus and asked him where he's staying. And he's, listen, foxes have dens that, you know, to lay down at night. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's pretty much telling him, he's like, guy, listen, do you want to follow me? I don't have a home. I don't know where we're staying. We're going to keep walking, and God's going to provide whatever our need is. So see that rock over there? That's your pillow tonight. He is trusting God to depend on that every day. This is what Jesus lived out. He depended on God all throughout his three and a half years of ministry on earth. See, if you're in a position of comfort, which probably most of us are, then for this prayer to transform us, we, need, we may need to take steps of faith where it's going to challenge all of us to actually depend on God. And this is going to be uncomfortable. But we have to stretch ourselves to the point that forces us to depend on God. What would you do, or what would you need to do, that would put you in a spot in life where it forces you to depend on God? Maybe it's a relational step. This idea of actually going to talk to the neighbors you've been living beside for the last few years but never talked to them to get to know them, to build relationships with them. Maybe it's a relationship with your spouse, taking steps where you need God to, de- you need to depend on God to come through in those situations. Maybe it's a family or friend who's far from God. And for a long time, you've kind of let them do their thing and let them live the way they live. And, you know, you, you've prayed for them and all that kind of stuff, but maybe it would take you to take a step of faith to actually engage them in this conversation, to invite them to join you in church, to invite you to explore this idea of faith. And you need to depend on God just to give you the courage and the trust to actually engage that conversation. Maybe it's a step of faith of, you know, volunteering and serving somewhere. You know, throughout COVID, which is fine, like we've we've kind of hunkered down, that's okay. But in the midst of all this, there's a lot of people in need. There's a lot of people struggling right now. This has been a very, very difficult year. And some of that difficult year has been for you. But maybe we know neighbors or family members or organizations around us where they're struggling. And we can jump in and serve and volunteer and make a difference. Maybe that step of faith you need to take is financial. Or you're pretty comfortable where you're at financially. But if you trust God to be generous... That's the point where it's going to really depend, you know, cause you to depend on God to keep providing your daily need. Maybe that's a step you need to take. One of the things I think about is often is this church and this idea of taking steps of faith financially. One, you know, this isn't a, a brag on my part, but this is just the nature of church planning is my wife Danielle and I and our boys, we left a very nice job in Wisconsin. Like, we were working at a great church. It was great. I had a nice salary. We had health benefits. We had retirement. It was awesome. And then when we left that, we don't have that anymore. It's like, oh, how do you get paid? Oh, I got to raise funds. Where are you going to live? I don't know yet. We'll find a place in Pittsburgh. Well, how are you going to start the church and buy all the equipment and do what you're supposed to do? I don't know. We're going to figure this out. Like, we had to depend on so many things. And God provided. Like, he, he's provided for us. We have been fine this whole time we've lived here. And I'm so thankful for that. But it took a lot of risk to the point where we, I don't think we've ever had to trust God more daily than we have in this process of starting one church. But that's not just Danielle and I. It's been us together as a church as well. You know, I think about buying this building. When we were renting at the school, it was stupid expensive. It was like killing us financially. But then we get to this building, we're renting it, and then this idea of buying the building comes up, and it's like, well, can we buy this building? Like, we're not even a self-sustainable church yet. Like, we, we lose more money than we, we bring in at this point. What are we going to do about this? Like, if we don't buy this building, where are we going to go after that? I don't know. It's a big conversation, a big tension. And people just step up like you. That we're able to purchase this building. We're able to start doing some of the renovations we've wanted to do for a long time. People giving time, people giving resources, people taking steps financially to be generous to make sure this stuff takes place. I can't tell you enough stories where, like, I'd really like to do this to the building. And someone goes, hey, I've been thinking about this. I want to do this to the building and help it financially. Can we do that? I'm like, that's what I've been praying for. This is crazy. (laughs) People have taken financial risks to depend on God, to trust him in this mission he's given us as a church. When we take steps to depend on God, we find the strength in that dependence. So my challenge is, is, what step are you taking to actually force you to need to depend on God? 
So we have to do that, and then we have to do this. This is one of those ones, it's like, we know it's true, but are we okay with it? It's help answer this prayer for each other. Notice how Jesus says, give us our daily bread. It's not give me my daily bread, Jesus. It's give us our daily bread. It's plural. It's not just you, it's us in this prayer. So when we pray this, it's not about looking out for my needs. It's about looking out for our needs and their needs, the people in our community, in our workplaces, and wherever we're at. It's looking out for their needs as well. Give us our daily bread means more than what, more when we're praying for the needs of others beyond ourselves. This idea of saying, God, give us our daily bread means, yeah, my needs are probably met, but that means there's probably other people that I know or have some connection that their needs are not being met, and I can help answer that prayer for them. This is what God has called me to do. The single mothers in our community, the family in poverty, the kids starving with, without water around the world. Think about those freezing right now in Texas without power. We can easily see different situations playing out in our lives, in our world, and there are people where their daily need is not being met. But the truth is, ours is, and we can do something about that. Shane Claiborne wrote a book called Becoming the Answer to Our Prayers. And the, the main gist of it is this, that God takes care of our needs, and then he empowers us to answer that prayer for others. Listen, we are, for the most part, fine. Our needs are met. We're not lacking food. We're not lacking water. We've got plenty, and we probably have too much. So maybe we're called to answer that prayer for others in some way, shape, or form. Uh, an old saint, which is probably the coolest saint name I've ever heard in my life, called Saint Basil the Great, says it this way, The bread that is spoiling in your house belongs to the hungry. The shoes that are mildewing under your bed belong to those who have none. The clothes stored away in your trunk belong to those who are naked. The money that depreciates in your treasury belongs to the poor. See, this is what we have to recognize sometimes. This is uncomfortable. But oftentimes we have too much because we're not giving it to those who need it. The early church lived this out extremely well. I mean, you read through the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church, they met whatever needs were needed around them. Like in a very simple point, if they had two coats and someone had none, guess what? They're giving a coat to the person who has none. If they had extra stuff, they had extra property or land, and they saw need happening, they would sell their stuff to meet the needs of others around them. They did whatever they could or whatever was needed to meet the needs of others. You know, so I think some of the things that we struggle with is sometimes like it's, we always have this mentality that it's like wrong to be wealthy and follow Jesus. Because Jesus says some harsh things to people who are wealthy in his ministry. Like, you know, it's going to be more difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is wealthy to get into the kingdom of God. And that sounds like, how is that possible? But what he's getting at is this. It's not wrong to be wealthy, but we have to recognize when we have wealth that we are empowered to do something about that to those who don't have their needs met. And here's the truth. Everyone here in this room and probably everyone watching online, we're wealthy. If our needs are met and then some, and we have extra, we have extra space, we have extra stuff, we are wealthier than we realize. And we are called to meet the needs of others. Now, what that looks like, I'm not here to say, like, this is what you have to do, sell your extra car, do this or that. That's, um, there's no, like, rules and stipulations to that. But we have to seek God out and say, God, how are you empowering me to meet the needs of others. Because the truth is, there is enough food and enough medical care for the entire world to have. But it's not being distributed that way. How do we fix that? I don't know. I think if I had that type of vision and mindset and ability, I don't think I'd just be a pastor. I'd be working in some bigger thing to help meet those needs. But I think one of the things I had the privilege of being a pastor about is I can help all of us recognize, okay, we can do something. We start where we're at. Start where we're at to start meeting needs. Pray for God to open yours and my eyes to how we can meet the needs of those around us. This is how we pray this prayer. And the one thing for this prayer is this, is to depend on God is to deepen our daily faith. And this is what this does. It deepens our daily trust 
in God. It deepens our dependence on him every single day. It means that every day we're not just like, oh, cool, I'm good. I don't have to worry about God. It's no, no, it's no, it's causing us to go to our time, go to our place to spend time in prayer with God to say, okay, God, help me to depend on you today. I need you to, to provide those needs for me. And if I have too much, help me to meet the needs of others. See, this prayer is one of trust and it's one of risk. It's about us taking steps towards depending on God more and more. And in this, we will find life. We will find more purpose. We'll find more meaning. We'll find more love. We'll find more understanding of seeing how God designed our lives to function when it comes to following his son. The pray this will lead us to more contentment. It will lead us to more joy. So the encouragement for all of us is to pray this moving forward. To worship God, to submit to God's will, absolutely, but then also to pray that we daily depend on God and see what this does. See how this opens your eyes. See how it changes the way you see things around you. See how it transforms your hearts and your lives to trust God more daily and to follow him more closely. And yes, it probably will mess some some stuff up in your life. One of the things I think we're learning through the Lord's Prayer in this series is if we're to pray the way Jesus teaches us to, our lives will not be the same moving forward. It's going to mess some things up. It's going to make us uncomfortable. It's going to make us to have questions, maybe some doubts, make us go like, God, are you sure about this? But if we learn anything from today, it's when we pray this, it means we depend on God more daily. And it deepens the trust we have in Him. And that is what we'll find our lives, meeting God's purposes more and more. So let's pray that way. Let's pray for God to meet our need. I'm going to pray. We're going to worship through this next song, but I want us to be thinking about during the lives we worship as you're singing of how your needs are met. But God has come through over and over and over again for you. It's not something to feel guilty about. It's something to give him praise about because he's faithful. He fulfills his promises. We ultimately see that through the cross. So the biggest need you and I ever had was not food or shelter or a job or whatever. We had the need that we did not measure up, that our sins separated us from God, and there was nothing we could do to ever get back to God on our own accord. Our biggest need was someone else fixing that because we couldn't do it ourselves. And God said, I got that need. He did it through Jesus. And so we worship that truth by communion each week. And so after this next song, we'll take communion together to worship him in the fact that we want to look at how God meets our need. We look at the cross. The biggest need we've ever had is taken care of through Jesus. We can depend on God moving forward because of that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you for... Uh, this, this church, this church that was started because of you and through you and because of your grace and, and your mercy and your provision and you working through a bunch of people who just trusted you. God, help us to continue to do that, to seek to depend on you daily and help us to recognize that depending on you, God, and worrying about, you know, maybe the fact that maybe you have to step in to take care of our need. That's not a bad thing. It's not a weak thing. That means that we just trust you more and we know you'll provide. God, help us to depend on you every single day. Help us to pray every day. Help us to know the difference between a want and a need. God, help us to meet this prayer need for others. Help us to take steps where we're going to really challenge ourselves to depend on you. And help us to recognize that you come through every time. In your name we pray.